Thank you, Lord. Listen to some degree that fits into what I'm, it, what I said. What we're going to share once again. We do encourage both those events are great events. Help, uh, you know, one event is a tremendous event in the family. I really want to encourage dads. Uh, I've often said I wish we were doing that when uh, when I was raising my girls. Uh, what a joy! Uh, what great memories uh, it, it would have been. You know, we got other memories, but I would have liked to have had those. Uh, you know, to think back on and, you know, as they have grown up. But uh, so really take advantage of that. Again, if you know somebody's got a daughter, would you invite them? Uh, would you uh, do what you can or do all you can to promote the ladies if gathering? You know, meeting one on one is a real significant way for people to encourage one another in their faith. Uh, you know, when somebody comes to church, and they they sit out there and they listen to me. They may have never listened to me before. Beyond that, they often do not know me. When you share your faith with Christ, you are the person they know, they've watched, uh, they've interacted with. Uh, uh, people come and visit church. They're they're not certain. I you know I get paid to do this. You know people think they don't know that this guy do this for free. At least this part of it. The rest of it you really would have paid me to do though. It's not <laughs> okay. All right. You know, we've been talking about hearing God. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to share your word and to teach and to preach your gospel. How grateful we are to, to know that your word is good seed. And as it's sown on good ground in our hearts, believing that will produce good fruit. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we've been talking about hearing God and Certainly God, he speaks to us, you know, through his word, and it's not only that he has spoken, and that's what I'm going to talk about this morning, but beyond that, he takes that and he does speak to our hearts individually, specifically about certain needs in our lives. I told a story about a pastor friend of mine one day, he's, he actually was a, uh, was a mentor to me, and, and early on, he let me preach my very first message, and he really was pretty bad, and uh, but let me do it nonetheless. And you know, and you just got to start. Having had said that, uh, he he was at a point. He's telling the story one time as a young man in the ministry that he's he's reading the scripture, and uh, and and the people are are wanting a they're wanting a new king, and he can't understand why this just keeps coming to him over and over again. The long short of the story was it's not it wasn't long that the some of the leadership of the church came to him and let him know that they felt like it was time for him to move on. Now you know that's always a difficult moment in a minister's life. I want you to know I've been fortunate to never suffer that. And I'm enormously grateful for, to you good people concerning that. Uh may not be God's plan for everybody to stay somewhere for their entire life. But I believe that there is far too much moving around in the ministry. But often you're not left with any options. The Lord was good enough to speak to this dear man about what was going to happen. And so when it did, his heart was prepared. See, God can take the word and talk to you specifically about the moment that you're in. Then he speaks to us in a still small voice. We talked about that. Now, we haven't just covered everything. He, he, at times, can speak to us through others. We said, you know, if, you, if you're really bullheaded, he's got donkeys that can speak. <laughs> no, I wasn't calling anybody doing the speaking donkeys. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. But listen, today, I, I, again, the word has already spoken. The scripture says this about, the, the Bible says this about scripture. We have a sure word of prophecy. Meaning this, somebody may have a word for you, and, and that's good. Now, I tell people all the all time, if someone feels impressed to tell me something, uh, I first of all, does it line up with scripture? Second of all, has he spoken to me about it? If he hasn't, I don't have to judge it one way or another. Just put it over here on the shelf and just let it be, okay? Because I always have the word of God. It is a surer word of prophecy, okay? 
Now, I want to talk to you about how God has already spoken. You know, we're living in, we're, we're living in difficult times, uh, not just in relationship of coming out of a pandemic, uh, but, you know, just the culture that we're in. Do you know that there is a, there is a war on morality in our nation? And, you know, God doesn't only speak to us, but he, he, he speaks to mankind. See, God's word is not just for Christians. It is God's world, word. He is God all by himself. He's not a God. He is, he is God. He alone is worthy. His word doesn't change. It doesn't return void. It accomplishes all it's sent to do. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity again to share your word, to teach and to preach your gospel. I thank you, word's good seed. I believe it produces good, good fruit in these lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to encourage people listening online, would you let us know that you're there? If you, you know, if we say something funny, laugh with us, uh, uh, like it, love it, share it, uh, comment on it, and sharing it's really important. I'm going to say some things today that it, you know, that, uh, I, I believe is important. Things that I think that the church should address that we often do not address. And, uh, you know, people do things, you know, you know, the church is often gets intimidated uh, with this term, this separation of church and state. I refuse to be intimidated by that statement. First of all, the words do not appear. Do not not appear in the Constitution. They're not there. On October the 1st, or on October the 6th, 1801, the Danbury Baptists, right, Thomas Jefferson, they're in, in Connecticut and in Massachusetts, the Congregational Church is the predominant church. Prior to the founding of this nation, they were the dominant church in this country. Local governments were still funding those congregations in 1801. They built the churches. Did you know that? They funded them. They paid the minister's salary. But they only funded the congregational churches. Did you know that? They paid the minister's salaries. Now... The Danbury Baptists, the Baptists, they're concerned that they could just be pushed out and marginalized. And so they're appealing to Thomas Jefferson. Now, let me tell you something you'll, you won't hear about Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson avoids answering their question. He's a politician. We've used this letter like it's a legal document. And it's not. 1946, first time the Supreme Court used the term, a, a wall of separation in a decision. Listen, Thomas Jefferson's letters carry no weight, but even then, Thomas Jefferson was assuring them that the state will stay out of their business. He says, with sovereign reverence, sounds pretty religious to me, sovereign reverence? And he's the president of the United States. He's saying sovereign reverence. I'd ever go on. Yeah, that's just a non-issue. But the church is intimidated. That's why they won't talk about the life of the unborn. That's why they won't take the you know take any any government official to task over things that they do, because they say oh, there's this this wall of separation. And uh, listen, the government's got to stay out of the church's business, but it is the church's responsibility to be the moral conscience of a nation Amen. and to hold the nation accountable when it goes off. Now, let me give you scripture. See, everybody likes Jonathan, don't they? Jonathan's the good guy. Jonathan will love on you, encourage you, help you, stand behind you. Everybody needs Jonathans in their lives. All right? Everybody needs a Mary and Martha in their life. You understand we're equal opportunity here. But you know what nobody wants? A Nathan. 
Nathan went to the king and said, you sinned. Now, I understand what people sometimes do, and, and, and listen, I, I understand it. My understanding why they do it and them being right is two different things, though. People say, well, now, Jesus, Jesus didn't do that. And, and, and I'll agree that Jesus took the religious community to task much more than he did the Romans. He has a whole different mission. He's coming to redeem mankind. We are the remaining church. Paul used Roman citizenship over and over again. So he, was, he didn't shy away from it either. And so again, there is, there is scripture for it. And I understand, again, Jesus was, it was very apolitical. Very apolitical. But that doesn't mean that the church must be silent on issues of morality, conscience, and sin. In Matthew, the 13th chapter, and verse 15, for this people's heart has become what? Calloused. King James says wax gross, hardening of the arteries. Not much blood flow in there. Then he says this, they hardly what? We're talking about hearing God. But when a nation's heart becomes hard, they hardly hear. And, and with their eyes, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I will heal them. Second Chronicles 7, 14 says, If my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. Without a turning, there is no healing. You know, last time I spoke, I've talked about, you know, God chastening us, and he chastens us with his word. Listen, that is how he deals with you and I. Now we're talking about how God deals with a nation, which is absolutely different. They what? They have, their hearts have become callous. Their, their ears have become closed. Their eyes they will not see. Listen, we're living in a time where unprecedented evil is being perpetuated by our government. I want to be very clear. Evil. Look the word evil up. It implies a spiritual force is behind it of wickedness. With a stroke of a pen, President Biden restores funding for abortions, both domestically and internationally. He took the legs out from under the Hyde Amendment, which prevented the government from using federal funds for abortion. He took, the, he took the strength out of the Mexico City policy, which prevented the United States from funding abortions around the world. You remember seeing the flags on the mall during the inauguration? There were over 200,000 flags on the mall. People gave money to sponsor those flags. And you know what they did with that money? They turned around and gave it to Planned Parenthood. Now, I want to know what part of Planned Parenthood has anything to do with parenthood. Zero. Now, I'm not going to, I'm not going to take up every issue because they, they're, they're too numerous. And I'm not talking about policy here. You know, you can be wrong on policy, but it not be evil. Not be evil. You can, have, you can have preference. You can like vanilla ice cream, and I can like chocolate ice cream. It, you know, I, listen, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about evil. Evil in government. I am not impressed by people attending church and doing evil. To get Democratic Congress, I'm very clear there, wasn't I? I didn't stutter. The Democratic Congress passed H.R. 5. That was without one Republican vote. 
You say, well, Bill, you're promoting. No, I'm patting them on the back for doing the right thing when they do the right thing. They do a lot of nutty stuff, too. The Democratic Part Congress passed H.R. 5 called the Equality Act. If I were black, I would be outraged because what they keep doing is changing the Civil Rights Act of 1964. H.R. 5, the Equality Act, is the most anti-religious legislation of the 21st century. This is what you've been hearing about in relationship to, to uh, uh, transgender males participating in, in women's sports. You understand it? You, you would just say that one and one equals two? Not anymore. It doesn't have to make sense. Not when evil abounds. This is, you know, when, you, when you're talking about this Equality Act, the, the, what they're going to do is that they're, they're going to endeavor to silence the kind of speech or the kind of message that I'm delivering this morning. And I'm telling you what, Christians are going to have to man up and decide that they're going to suffer a few consequences. Amen. Amen. My friends in Canada already can't say this stuff, that they'll be arrested. When you're talking about this sort of thing, what you're talking about is... is it, it, Listen, folks, when we talk about gender, you are created with a gender. You're fooling with the, with, with, with the will of God. He created male and female. The word trans isn't in there anywhere. And I don't want to make light of anybody. I understand that people have suffered things in life. They've suffered certain abuses, indignities. Because of examples, maybe they've become confused. I'm not, I'm not here to tell you that there aren't people struggling with their identity. This is why it's so important to know who you are in Christ. I'm not saying people aren't struggling with their identity, that teenage kids aren't having a tough time, tough time, that pu Puberty isn't a difficult time in their lives. It is, it, it, that can be difficult under the best of circumstances, but it can also be the greatest times of their lives. The Equality Act, you know, if they pass this, we're, we're, we're talking about even in our own bathrooms, you know, they would, they would suggest that, uh, you know, that a man identifying as a woman could go into a woman's bathroom, that a woman identifying a man could go into a man's bathroom. They can tell us who we can hire and who we can't hire. See, when you, you pass civil rights, rights le legislation, it's powerful stuff. This is not just some wackos. I shouldn't say things like that. This is not just some per... You understand, you don't win arguments by insulting people. Remember that. You don't win arguments by insulting people. So for anybody who disagrees with me, I, I apologize for the word wacko. I, I'm being genuine. I'm not being silly. But this is not just some guys on the street corner's opinion, right? We're not just talking about what two consenting adults want to do behind closed doors. We're talking about legalizing immorality. I want to use the word evil again. Just this week, Congressman Jerry Nadler there was a post on Facebook they misquoted. They didn't say exactly what he said. So Facebook pulled it off. Well, let me tell you, Facebook, here's what he said. What any religious tradition describes as God's will is of no concern to this Congress. He's supposed to be a, of the Jewish faith. What any religious tradition describes as God's will is of no concern to this Congress. You'll see this, this next slide. You know, I, I, I love the fact that our founding fathers, you know, uh, had a little foresight. You know, this, this secularization of the United States is a travesty. It's revisionist history. Now, as Jerry Nadler is standing 
because a man has just got up and he's read from the book of Exodus. They were not liking what he was reading from Exodus. Uh, he was quoting from Romans. They were not liking what he was quoting from Romans. He said, I'm going to, the, the gentleman was a congressman from, uh, uh, from Florida. I, I should have wrote his name down. And, uh, but anyway, he, he said, I'm going to do what, anybody else, what nobody else is going to do today. I'm going to read the truth because I'm going to tell you what scripture says. I like him. I like him. Now I realize you can't legislate that way, but you certainly can get up and make your case that way. Now, as Jerry Nadler standing there, and actually he's on, he's on this side looking that way, right at it, all right? Right over the speaker's head, there are these words. Hit that again. Make that transition for me. No, no, no. Hit, hit advance. There you go. What's that say? I must matter. It must matter. Right over the speaker's head. Above the what? Thank you. The flag represents what? The nation, the country. What is above the flag? Thank you. Little lesson for Jerry Nadler. Now we're talking about evil. And I'm not that I can't I, I I can't apologize for that and won't. We're talking about evil. We're talking about something that's pernicious, wicked. There's a spiritual power and force behind evil. Now, transgender pe pediatrician, Dr. Rachel Lev Levine. This is a transgender male functioning as a woman. That's probably the overly now, you get it. I said transgender. President Joe Biden cabinet pick. All right, this is his cabinet pick. This is his cabinet pick. You, so, people voted for this. People voted for this. They told them what they were going to do. And people voted for this. Christian people voted for this. You understand, I, what am I, I am endeavoring to prick the church's conscience. And listen, and then we got Christians sitting on the sidelines too busy to be in a house of worship while Congress is passing garbage and they don't even know what's going on. His cabinet pig. Now listen. I'm not going to say that Dr. Levine is not capable of being a kind person or a thoughtful person. But here's her position. She's going to be the, if, if confirmed, Assistant Secretary of Health. She believes this, sex, male or female, is what she refers to as fluid. Fluid. Levine described children, and I'm, 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 I mind you, I'm very careful. Unlike some of the Facebook quotes that take people out of context, I will not do that. I'm talking about direct quotes, and not quotes out of context. I have a conscience. I stand before God. I, I, I have accountability. Levine has described children as young as five or six years old as knowing which gender they want to be. In 2017, in a speech at Franklin and Marshall College, she's talking about pre-pubertal children. She has a, she, she's, he the doctor. I, that's tough stuff. You get it. You all right? The doctor. The doctor speaks a lot about how difficult puberty is for children. Spends a lot of time. Goes on to say, again, direct quote, might present, so these pre-pubertal children might present in different ways. They might present at school in the gender that they were identified as birth. 
this is a quote, they might present as the other gender, and they might be gender fluid, could change from time to time. You understand I could take that with a lot of sarcasm, but I didn't. I, just the way it reads is just awful. I don't have to add any sarcasm to it. Levin has described children again as young as five, six, knowing what children, gender they want to be. Levine describes prescribing puberty, blocking, and cross-gender hormones injections to children who expressed anxiety about the natural process of puberty. Wow. Wow. Isaiah 5.20. Woe to them who call what? Now what's, what's, woe! Woe! Most times someone says woe means duck. Woe! To them who call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for, for bitter. Now again, not endeavoring to make any personal attacks. We're talking about things that are we're talking about things that are moral. We're talking about sin. Sin. In the church world today, once again, that it's, it's not a popular subject. Listen, you know, the reason the Bible addresses sin, because sin is your greatest enemy. It is the greatest deterrent to a personal relationship with Christ. It is the thing that separates us from God. But yet today, you know, the, you know, the position would be, we don't want to make anybody feel bad. We don't want to make anybody feel guilty. Well, listen, I don't want to intentionally make anyone feel bad. I don't want to intentionally make anybody feel guilty. But listen. I certainly don't want to miss, I certainly, I'll tell you what I don't want to do. I don't want to misrepresent the truth. So that there are, once again, is there, are there feelings and is there emotions that comes with somebody saying that we are accountable and we are responsible? Yes, there is. I, I, I never find it pleasant to find out I'm wrong. I have often found it beneficial. I've often found it beneficial. You know, I've worked on things before, and I've ruined, I've ruined a part before, putting a part on a car, not knowing how to do it. Ruined the part because I didn't know how to do it. Had to get another one. Well, gosh, this is about life. It's much more important than a part. Listen, our greatest defense against sin is to be shocked at it. You should be shocked. As I, I'm not shocked at anything. Well, then you, 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 you listen, you're in trouble. Don't, don't, be, don't be saying that stuff out loud. So, oh, I'm not shocked by anything. Anymore. But whoa. Then your hearts can become what? Hardened. Hearts become hardened. Our greatest defense against sin is to be Shocked at it. Let's go to Romans, the first chapter. Listen, I'm, I, I, have, I have no intent to be malicious. I, I've, I've ever intent to tell the truth. Romans, the first chapter. You know, lots of people said, well, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly how I feel about, you know, these, you know, about, LGB, LGBTQ, RS, no, don't do that, Bill, forgive me. You understand, it's, it's, it's something, it used to be LGBT, or it used to be LGB, then LGBT, now the LGBTQ, and uh, listen, for although they, and, and don't think that the letters are done, because we're going to find more ways to pervert sexuality. So I'm, I, I, I'm going to be a prophet here, and I'm going to say, the letters have not finished. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. So see, 
for this verse to, uh, to play out, they've had to know God. So this is speaking to a specific group of people. They had to know God, although they what? Knew God. They neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking, thinking became futile. Here's what happens. When you know God, but you don't glorify him. When you know God and you don't worship him. Let me say that. When you know God and you don't worship him. When you know God and you don't worship him. I hope that penetrates the church. Hey, listen, we talk about God at, at home. When you know God and you don't worship him. This is what happens. It's progressive. First, your thinking becomes futile. You rationalize your lack of faith, your lack of spirituality, your lack of hunger. Well, then, but then it progresses. Then the heart, oh, the heart becomes darkened. The foolish heart is, heart is darkened. And although they claim to be wise, they became, they became futile. Their hearts were darkened. And they became what? Romans 124. Now, in between here, it talks about the worship of animals and nature, and there's plenty of that going on. And I'm not, I'm not talking about you, not, you know, about loving your cat and your dog. That's not what I'm talking about. But you understand, there's a loving of nature. You worship and serve the, crea the creatures rather than the creator. Romans 121. This is what I'm talking about, though, so I'm staying with this subject. Therefore, God gave them over to their what? Everybody say sinful. Everything that I talk about after this is what? So what do you know? Anytime you 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 know you go you go to the you go to the last description in the in the or the first description in the subject, then it describes everything afterward. So therefore, God gave them over to sinful desires of their heart, and what? Everybody say sexual impurity. Listen, if you've got a kid up here, don't worry about this. They're talking about a lot worse things than this at school. And we're, this is, I'm keeping this holy. I'm keeping this on, on the word. I'm keeping this on God. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires and their hearts of sexual impurity, degrading of their bodies with what? That's pretty clear, isn't it? Again, I say it's not a Greek or a, or a Latin problem. This is an English issue. A little further. Verse 26. Because of this. What? Because of their sinful desires. Because of their sinful desires. They had hearts for sexual impurity. For degrading their bodies with one another. Because of this, God gave them over to what? Shameful. Everybody say shameful. shameful. Now, that's not my idea. This is what the Word says. I, I don't know how I feel about same-sex relationships. Well, let me tell you how God feels about it right here. Even their women exchanged... I, I, now, I'm not saying that... Don't, don't take it out of context. I'm not saying that people are, cannot care about others. I'm not saying that people aren't gifted. I'm not saying that people aren't talented. I'm not saying any of those things. I'm saying what God says about the behavior. I'm just reading it. God gave them over to what? Shameful lust. Even women exchange natural relations for unnatural ones. Is that clear? Again, uh, this is English. In the same way, the men abandoned natural relationships with women and were inflamed. Everybody say inflamed. inflamed. With lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men. I don't know how I feel about these things. Would you like for your feelings to be in line with God? 
But Bill, I got friends, I got family. We all do. I'm not saying that you don't love somebody. I'm not saying I don't love them. I love people who have drug problems and I want to help them, don't you? And I love people who's got sexual problems and I want to help them. This impacts other people, impacts families. Men committed indecent acts with other men received in themselves, listen to this, I've, I'm going to underline it, due penalty for their what? What did God call it? What does he say that there is for perversion? Hey, see, the English really is pretty easy. Now, they want to talk to a three-year-old about hormone therapy. That's called perversion. Can I tell you there's a penalty for perversion? A penalty. Now, again, there would be, you know, you know, lots of times people are well-intentioned. I understand, you know, I, and I always appreciate people being well-intentioned. I want to be well-intentioned and... I believe I'm well-intentioned this morning. But they're well-intentioned. It was said, well, Bill, I, 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 I want to reach them. Well, just tell me, how successful are you at reaching them? So all your well-intentions in the world, who's getting saved? Who's getting born again? Whose lives are being transformed by the glory of God? Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a uh, depraved mind. I've underlined it. King James says reprobate mind. To do what ought not be done. Listen to this. There comes a time when God gives up on men. I didn't make that up. That's what it says. He gave what? He gave them over. They've become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They're gossips. Slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. Listen to this. They invent evil ways of doing evil. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things, what's it say? Wow. Now, you, you, see, you understand why silence on this is critical? We're worried about hurting someone's feelings, and I understand has ever potential in the world these, these kind of things to hurt somebody's feelings, but there's a penalty. They not only continue to do these things, but they also, listen, also approve of those practicing them. They do these things, and they approve of those who what? Practice them. Your approval as a Christian is their permission for behavior. Your approval becomes their permission. Write that down. Your approval becomes their permission. Listen, it says in Matthew the chapter eight or chapter eighteen, verse six. But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, 
which believe in me. It were better for him that a millstone hang about his neck, that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Now listen to me, okay? I, I want you to know, I, I don't, when, I, when I get ready to do something like this, th there's nothing off the cuff. I have spent time reading, studying, and praying, not off the cuff. So these are not my wild-eyed moments, okay? When you want to go into kindergarten, first, second, third grade, anywhere in school, and you want to push a sexual agenda, you are recruiting. Did you hear the word? You are recruiting. They are recruiting our children. Now you understand. I'm, I'm not for... In, I'm not for... Not for insurrection. But I am for a moral revolution. They're recruiting our children. It was enough for consenting adults. Listen, this stuff's always been around. You know, they lied to me all my life. They told me for they told me all my life when I when I read these studies, ten percent of the population has always been, you know, gay, homosexual. You know what it is? It's five point eight percent. They told me all my life is 10%. They just, you know, they just fabricate numbers. They just pull them out of nowhere. And even then, that's not scientific. But I guarantee this. It's highest among 8 to 20. Now we read Matthew 18.6. Who shall ever offend one of these little ones? Here's what offend means. It's the, in the Greek, it's the word scandalon. So there, for those who need a little Greek, there you go. Scandalon. It's, it's where we get the word. It's, uh, uh, if, if you've ever set one of those traps where the animal goes in, grabs the bait, and pulls the stick out from underneath it, that stick is the scandalon. It's the trip. It means to entrap, to trip, or to entice to sin. It's what called recruitment. Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. That's powerful. Now listen to me. You could steal my wallet that doesn't say that. Is it sin? Yeah. You can steal my horse. We used to hang people for stealing horses. Does it say that about stealing horses? This is the only thing that it says that about. It says this, Ray, there is a more severe punishment for enticing children to sin than any other sin. You say, oh no, all sins are alike. No, all sins not alike. All sin offends God. All, all, all sin separates you from God. Some sins have greater ramifications than others. Therefore, they have greater consequences than others. I'm not making this up. This is what Jesus said. Whosoever shall offend one of these little ones and trap them, trip them, and entice them to sin, recruit them. Send your kids off to college. They got men in every town recruiting young, gifted, talented young men. They love music, they love art, they're gifted, they're talented. They wine them, they dine them, they recruit them. Well, I'm, I know, not, yeah. There's a concerted effort. They see themselves as mentors. You understand? Oh, you, gotta, you just got to spin it, James. They're mentors. 
because old evil dad back home suppressed them. But I'm your mentor. Once again, for those, it's better to have a millstone tied around your neck. said, it's better. You'd be better off with a millstone tied around your neck. And we're drowned in the depth of the sea, then what's going to happen? Why? Remember what Romans says? There's a penalty. There's a penalty. Proverbs. Where there is no vision, what do people do? Perish. No vision, no revelation. No redemptive revelation of God. See, when you, when, you have a, when, you, when you know the image of God, when you know the word of God, when you know the presence of God, there's something redemptive about it. No vision means you do not accept divine guidance. That, once again, this is speaking to that in Romans. You are without guidance from God. Where there's ignorance of God. See, when we abandon God's guidance, we forfeit his grace. Oh, would a, heaven, would, a, would a loving God, yes, when you abandon his guidance, you forfeit his grace. Where there is no revelation, people, what do they do? They throw off, they throw off restraint. But blessed is he who what? Keeps the law. Blessed is he who keeps the law. Proverbs 29, 18 tells us two things. There's a cause and there's a consequence. This is what Paul is warning them in Romans, the first chapter. Here's those two points. Cause. As a nation, we reject God's what? Guidance. The consequence? Now there's no restraint. See, this is why you just, you, you can just, we, we, we can burn down cities. Was that evil? No, 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 that's not evil. That's a, that's protest. No, when you burn down somebody's business, it's evil. It's evil. It's evil rampaging. When you spit on police officers, it's evil. There's consequences. When you loot stores, it's what? It's evil. But see, those things are nothing more, okay? But they see, there was a cause. Long before there was ever a, a looter. Long before there was ever a looter. Way, way back, before there was a looter. We what? We rejected divine guidance. There was a cause. We, we rejected his guidance. So we... We do not protect the unborn. We have redefined marriage in the family. Now we're redefining sexuality. These are things that nobody would... You, you just said this back in the, in the 1990s. You'd said, listen, transgender is going to be normal. And you'd say, nah, you know, there will always be, you know, but nah. Yeah. But see, the what? There was a cause way back there. The Jerry Nadlers of the world? Nah. Whatever God's will is by these, denom by these religions is of no consequence here. As a nation, we reject God's guidance. The consequence, there's no restraint. Where there is no revelation of God, the people, what? They cast off restraint. I've got to wrap this up. Judges 2.10 says, all that generations were gathered together to their fathers. If the Lord tarries one of these days, they won't be somebody like me standing up here ranting. We'll be gathered to our fathers. We'll go to be with the Lord. And there's going to rise another generation. Now, we have some good folks here. Listen to me. I, have, I, I do have confidence in you. But I'm talking about the culture at large. And there'll be a generation we get when they're gathered to their fathers. There'll be another generation after them who did not know, recognize, or what? Not understand. 
Not understand that, you know, while you're, while you're trying to be friendly, they're falling. They're hurting. People are lost. You know, the argument that, that, that Dr. Levine would, Levin would make would, would be this. Is that, that's, listen, you need to help these kids out. They're struggling. They've got emotional problems. The suicide rate is, is high among them. Yes, it is. You know why? Because we quit treating these things as a disorder about 40 years ago. It was no longer considered a disorder. So, of course, if you're not treating people, what if we didn't treat people who had problems with alcohol? The suicide rate goes up. Isn't that right? Of course. If you didn't treat people who had depression, what happens? The suicide rate goes up. So if you don't treat a child who's struggling with sexual feelings, you know what happens? I don't have a doctorate. It's pretty simple. Not knowing, recognizing, and understanding the Lord or the work which he had done. There's no what? There's no memory of God. Judges 2, 10, and 11, the living Bible. But finally, all that generation died. The next ge generation did not worship Jehovah as their God. They did not care about his mighty miracles or what he'd done for Israel. It's closing statements. They did many things that the Lord had expressly forbidden. They did many things, and seeing this is why I bring this up this morning. I'm just talking about from January the 6th till now. Or I've, January the 20th, I apologize. You understand we've heard that date so much it's engraved in our minds. Yeah. They did many things that the Lord expressly forbidden. There's what? No restraint. So see, there's no restraint. They feel emboldened to do these things. Just emboldened to perpetuate. I know they wouldn't call it evil. I'm not going by their definition of evil. I'm going by what the Scripture says. What does God's Word say? It's evil. See, men no longer can hear God. Why? Their ears have waxed gross. Their hearts have hardened. They do not hear. They do not want to see. It says they shut their eyes. Bow your heads. Listen, you might be here this morning, irregardless what you think about the times in which we live. Heaven's real, hell's real. God sent his son to redeem us so we would not suffer the consequence of sin. But the Bible says that we must make a change. There's a turning. There's not just a turning from something. There's a turning to someone, and that's God. See, the biggest thing about repent is to turn to him. I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm all for fleeing evil. The Bible teaches us that. But you must turn to him. We don't have the stamina nor the resistance to resist evil on our own. We, what we turn to him. We turn to him and we make him the Lord of our lives. We say, you are in charge. You're in charge of my thoughts, my feelings, my identity. Jesus, come into my life. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. Most importantly, I accept you as my Lord. You're in charge of everything. I give you everything. I give you my hurt. I give you my pain, but I also give you my gifts, my abilities, and my talents. I surrender it all to you. 
Well, change me and use me. If you've never accepted Christ, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. If you have wandered in your faith, we're also going to give you an opportunity to reaffirm your faith. We say backslid, wandered. I'm going to pray. Everybody's going to pray together because the Bible says we can pray one for another. Let's do this. Say this with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your son Jesus. I believe that he lived. I believe that he died. I believe he died for me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Cleanse me. Forgive me. I accept you now as my Lord and as my Savior. I receive forgiveness of sin and the free gift of eternal life. Old things are passed away. My sin, my hurt, my habits. I accept you now as my Lord and my Savior. Amen. With every head bowed, no one looking around, if you're here this morning and you say, Bill, I'm not certain I've ever accepted Christ before. But when you prayed, I've, I, I by invitation, I've, I've, I've asked him with all that's in me to come into my heart, to be the Lord of my life and to save me. If you've wandered in your faith and say, Bill, I prayed and I reaffirmed my faith this morning. I, 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 I'm recommitted, reconnected. I, 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 I picked control back up, but I'm laying it back down. I've wandered, but I'm back. If that's you on either one of those invitations, just look up real quickly. I want to know who we prayed with and for this morning as we look around the room. Give me just a moment. Thank you. Another moment. Lord, we love you. Father, I thank you. You look down from heaven. And you see our hearts. You see the decisions and the commitments we make. Thank you, Father, for your love and your saving grace. Thank you for transforming and changing our lives. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Grant each and every one, Father, who prayed this morning, whether in here or online, the assurance of that salvation and love. God, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen a little bit. There'll be prayer partners up here. And, and if you prayed with us this morning, we invite you to come up and say something to, to them have them pray with you and encourage you. And then I always like to tell people, tell somebody if you made a decision. Jesus is confessing us before the Father. We should confess him before men. Give Leon a hand.